And thanks to the whole team at Vanderbilt for putting this together, for bringing these wonderful people all together. Um, thank you all so much for attending. We're gonna be talking about producer side access to information, education, and professional development. And I hope that in the course of this conversation, even if I direct a question to one of you um, individually, that if there are reflections that come up or if you wanna offer thoughts, everyone just sort of jump in. I feel like we're all old friends now that we've been preparing for this so we can just chat as though we were having a cup of coffee. Um, but so what we wanna explore in this conversation today is not only the significance of ensuring that information and education is accessible to coffee producers around the world, but also talk about the ways in which the barriers to accessing those things can really hinder the efforts to create greater equity in the coffee industry. I'm also going to ask the panelists about their personal experience with trying to increase access to information because each one of the people who participates today has a very unique position working directly with producers and having a little bit of a broad view of what's going on in consuming countries, how coffee professionals along other aspects of the supply stream discuss coffee and how funneling that conversation and those, that information back to producers can have real impact. So just to kind of give you some information about me before I get started, like who is this person who's moderating this panel? Um, my name's Eva Meister. I'm a coffee journalist and an educator. I've worked in the industry for over 21 years. And a lot of my work as a communicator has been toward the consuming side because that's the area in which I have always worked. But over the past few years, I have really significantly tried to improve and increase um, and my own personal connection with the producing community and to amplify those voices because I'm sure as everyone on this panel can attest to, unfortunately, historically, the producer voice has really been left out. So this is a really exciting panel for me and I'm super excited to hear from all of you. I would love it if, I know that Haynes introduced everyone, but I would love if you could tell us a little bit more specifically about what you do in coffee and why this particular topic is of interest to you. And I'd love if we can start with you, Smaya. Um, tell us a little bit more about yourself if you don't mind. There, hi everybody. Great honor for me to be part of this conversation. As you said, the project has out for a while. I think we're all trying to do what we can to allow their voices to be heard. But at the same time, we talked about the challenges, why the information is not being here. There's a lot of language barriers problem and all that. Um, but I will try to speak with my uh, not so bad English um, to allow you or everybody who we link today to at least connect the people I represent uh, through whatever I will be sharing today. Uh, personally, I've had uh, experience working in the coffee for the past six years. Um, I joined this industry as a fresh high school graduate student who was just looking for money to save for college. Um, I had no idea about anything about coffee. All I needed is something that would allow me to save for college. But a few months later, after joining as a barista and working handy with the coffee farmers in Rwanda, women coffee growers in Rwanda, I realized that there was a lot of possibility and opportunity for me to use my job to impact their lives as well. And I think this topic is really, really important to me because I relate to it. And I know that one of the drive or one of the reason why I do everything on a daily basis is because I want them to be heard. I want their work to be seen and they don't have access to the social media, to all this technology. So if I'm able to be here today, I wanna to be able to share every experience, uh, everything I've learned from them and also my journey and experience overall. Currently, I moved to um, Egypt for the past six months. Um, I left Rwanda March this year. Um, I'm here to promote Rwandan coffee still, so I'm still connected to my people. Uh, and it was a great opportunity for me as I continue to participate in a lot of uh, global conversation uh, and, you know, voluntarily trying to help them sell their coffee. It finally became a very good responsibility um, to be able to stand here in a very big country like Egypt 
where there's a very strong uh, coffee culture and be able to share a great cup of coffee from Rwanda and you know continue to support uh, farmers in Rwanda. So I will say, but also uh, for professional background, I'm a SMSA certified barista, roster, uh, Hugh Greter. I've participated in a lot of um, competition, brewing competition. I've attended a lot of uh, global coffee events. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. <laughs> Thank you. You've had a very busy six years in this industry. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Uh, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. And we've already got someone in the in the uh, chat saying they love Rwandan coffee. So good job. <laughs> um, Isabel, how about you? Do you mind introducing yourself? Sure. Uh, so first of all, I wanted to thank for the invitation. I accept this and I felt really honored. And this is a big, big um, uh, responsibility to be here. And last week I watched the, the panel as well and was amazing. And I see that we have almost the same issues with uh, access to things depending on which social class you are. And so I am Isabel Vilela and I live in Campo Belo in the Campo das Vertentes region. And I'm transitioning between careers in, in coffee, but I've been a, a barista, I work in a coffee exporter company, and I was manager for EWCA Brazil uh, here. And then uh, I also accompanied my father and brother in the coffee growing um, process. And besides being a, a daughter of a coffee growing person, I, I have all these experiences inside coffee because I, I met the WCA's work here in Brazil. And then with these women, I was able to, uh, to meet a lot of coffee professionals, to go to many coffee fairs and work with them and hear their stories. And uh, mostly from women, but also I got to know mainly uh, a lot of coffee farmers uh, mainly small ones, and this is why this topic is so important to me. Thank you so much. Thank you, that's wonderful. And Alejandro, how about you? Look at what he has the most interesting uh, background just floating above the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> that's in Mexico, that's looking to the Pacific from Oaxaca. So it's, uh, yeah, it's one of the regions where we, where we, where we work in. Um, it's one of the ones that I'm most fond of these days. Um, so thank you, uh, Haynes and Vanderbilt University for in inviting me, and, and it's great to be here with Isabel and Smaya, and also with you, Meister. Um, as you said, you know, we, we it, it seems like we're now you know good friends after a few just a few Zoom calls, um, but it's great to be in this in this talk today, this conversation with all of you today. Uh, I am the co-founder and CEO of Carella. I've been working in the coffee industry for about 21 years, although I would say that I've been in the coffee industry all my life, um, just because my dad uh, worked in the coffee industry. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I'm part of a team of about 250 people, most of them uh, sons and daughters of coffee farmers or, or, or people from, from the rural areas in Latin America. We work in seven countries in Latin America, including Mexico, uh, Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. And we, we try to work with uh, smallholder farmers in these countries and um, help them access markets and, and get a better, better price for their, for their great, great uh, coffees that they produce. And over the course of these 21 years, um, you know, I've seen the struggles of many of these farmers and I've seen farmers you know, really improve their quality of life thanks to the, to the hard work and passion that they, 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 they do every day their coffee farms and, and together with the families, their wives, their kids, uh, and even the, 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 the farm workers who are, you know, generally very passionate as well about coffee. It's, it's not easy to be picking coffee in, in, in the fields. It's, it's, a, it's a tough job. So you really have to have some passion to do it. Um, and this topic about equity is, is quite dear to me because it's been, it's been a, a pressing issue for me in the last five or six years where I've seen that the industry has improved a lot uh, in these 20 years that I've been in the industry. But you still see a, a huge gap between what what uh, what farmers and farm workers and, and the people in, in the rural areas of the farm of the coffee lands, and what is, ha is happening in destination in the consuming countries, and that's something that I think we as an industry must address sooner rather than later. 
and it's not just because it's it's the right thing to do it's also because um if we don't if we don't solve it uh, we're going to have you know we're going to face huge issues in in the next few years um so it's it's not just the right thing it's it's the only thing that we sh we we really be fo we must be focusing on and and i think um it's it's something that more more and more companies should should uh, should start to focus on so um delighted to be here and and it's, i hope we have a great conversation so far so good i think um one of the really impactful things i think about this panel in particular is that you know we're all sort of i i have a feeling we'll probably all be speaking on behalf of smallholder producers because that seems to be the unifying kind of relationships that that everyone on this panel has had and i think it's important to recognize that there's like smile like you said immediately you know right off the bat there's this lack of access to even an event like this and i just want to acknowledge that that you know that adds another layer of complexity to even having these conversations because there aren't groups of smallholders in the room sort of talking about their own experiences um, so I just want to be conscious of, of that, especially as I ask questions from even further removed. Um, but I wanted to start, Samaya, in particular, by asking you, you have, as like we said, you've already done, you've already done 20, 20 had 20 careers in your short career. Um, and I'd like to know about the kinds of resources that you've encountered. You know, what types of information have you had access to and how are you granted access to each of these different sort of toolboxes along the way as you've moved through various different roles? And like what kind of resources are available to the producers that you work with, um, just generally speaking throughout your experience? Great. Oh my God, that's a great question. First of all, I'm fascinated about the experience from other panelists, but um, I think before I start, with my own experience and resources that were available for me, I think I will start with what I found available for the farmers that then gave me a reason to have uh, a career. Um, when I started working in the in this industry, I started with a company that was called Sustainable Growers. It was initiated by Americans. The founder is uh, also a very big known person who is a uh, 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 CEO and founder of Sustainable Harvest uh, in Portland, Oregon. They they were doing this with you know South American and uh, Central American farmers before, but then they were it was the first time for them to come to Rwanda. So they came over in 2013, and they started with about four thousands of women farmers who survived genocide, who had a lot of. Um, really bad background hiv aids and positive and a lot of weird stuff but then who had a little bit of a background working in the coffee before everything was punished um so they're focusing on that and they trained them on how to grow high specialty coffee they hired agronomists that were just finishing a high school from agricultural schools in rwanda to facilitate the training programs. So that's that was all that they were receiving. But at the same time, they're like, we have we will have to showcase this coffee that is being grown by these women coffee growers. And that's how we were the first cohort to be trained as baristas to showcase their coffee uh, to the consumers. And that's how I found myself behind the bar serving their coffee. But I think I started with my own goal to have to get some money to go to college. I kind of identified a little bit with farmers um, being from a very big family and not have access to a high level of education. So I had to find out a way of, you know, surviving in that kind of a way, because um, in Africa, you know, education or high level education for girls is not seem to be very important. So you will find most of the girls right after high school, they'll be getting married, hoping that the husbands could support them with college fees. And sometimes it doesn't. So there are not a lot of options, but I were also grateful to have been able to grow up in a good governance that continues to empower women and girls on a daily basis. Um, so I was lucky, I would say. But at the same time, um, after a few months, 
uh, being a barista, I was sent to collect stories from these women coffee farmers. I was a blogger back in high school. I loved to write poems and stuff. So when my boss find out, like, you have to go collect the story. Um, so when I went to the field, I was born and grew up in Kigali City. I don't know how people in rural area are surviving. I know I survived. I grew up in a very not a very good life, but at the same time, when you see what people are going through, you really learn to appreciate the little thing that you're able to get. If I was able to get two meals per day and now I have to spend a whole week with farmers, uh, witnessing them having a one meal per day, uh, women living almost their lives shoeless, uh, having to carry lots of kilos of cherries on their head uh, while it's raining and the baby's in the back. I was very young, I was 17, but I was like, no, there's, this has to change. And nobody's gonna do that. It's gonna be me and whoever else is around me. Um, as as uh, he mentioned before, there's just a lot of things that you get to witness and you're like, why is this happening? And how can I be part of the change? So it really gave me courage and I never looked at coffee the same way again. I wanted to make sure that every customer that comes inside knows the efforts that these women farmers are putting into to create this coffee, this amazing coffee that I'm getting to invest in with the craft of brew and, and then have to understand that they're paying and they're contributing towards their change. And I did not... Um, uh, and having access to these people or these organizations that are international, it makes you, uh, if you're reasonable and passionate enough, you're going to see a lot of possibilities in the industry, which most of the youth don't have. And they don't have it because of a lot of different reasons. It's not about money. It's a lot of small things that most people are not aware of. Um, but I saw a lot of opportunities and possibilities for me to uh, represent them from the national level to regional level and to international level. So that's how I started applying for a different scholarship program. And I was like, I don't wanna be a barista in the next two months, I mean, two years, I wanna be this, I wanna be that. And I would tell my boss, hell, I don't see any female rosters in Rwanda. Uh, and I'm trying to learn something from this male roster who doesn't wanna share the skills. So I'm like, I have to get that, whether you want or not. So I started uh, using my uh, social media, asking questions to random people that I don't know. And I'm really, really thankful for this coffee, specialty coffee community. People are just great. They wanna share their skills uh, as long as you wanna know. Um, but at the same time, who have the access to uh, social media or that, it's also a question. So I, I was able to earn lots of scholarship with through SCA and you know, sponsored by SD Coffee and Tea that allowed me to grow myself professionally. So I wrote, that's how I chose to uh, become a roster. And then a lot of opportunities continue to come and I kept on applying for more. It's like, there is no limit to what we can be in this industry. As long as you believe in yourself and somebody mentioned passions and passion and love, but at the same time, you really, you go is to help yourself to help somebody. It's not only you per se, it's like you really identify a huge gap between the consumer side and the producer side. And you realize that these people will never know what is the defect, they don't know. Um, everything is, I feel like this industry is more driven by buyers. Everything that we will get from that world and we have to do whatever we have to do to comply with it so that we can sell the coffee. So it's just a lot. Um, and my biggest concern always is all about what is it gonna be tomorrow? How are we going to, uh, what can we do to sustain what we have? And what we can do is to strengthen these coffee farmers, is to motivate them, is to make them feel uh, valuable, respected, and have them part of these tables, talk about the challenges that they encounter because they know better than we do. Um, so that's how I, I was able to get all these resources that then I went back home and embraced their work through the art of roasting and started selling, you know, at least thinking that, okay, if we sell more coffee, at least they will get, they will get two meals per day. They will do this. They'll do that. 
Um, I think to really cut it short, that's how I would answer your question. I hope it helps. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. And I would also like to extend that question to you, Isabel and Alejandro. In particular, you you two you know come from and have spent so much of your career in the two major coffee growing countries in the world, right? With the such a vast number of smallholders in that growing network and. I wonder what kinds of resources are generally available. Do you find that smallholders generally have access to technical information or do they ever have sort of marketing information, how to sell coffee? Um, is it you know, agro ag agronomy support? Like what kinds of resources are available generally speaking? Me first. <laughs> So, well, a uh, little of background about Brazil is that we are, per se, a society really unequal. So we are a colonized country. So Portuguese people came here and gave a lot of land for their own peers. And we have the enslaved people that came from Africa and we had indigenous people here before. So still today, you, you see this in the society. So of course, as we are saying, we have the small farmers and we have the state farms. And of course, these people in the state farms, mostly of the time they are white and come from this uh, heritage from uh, these Portuguese people that came or others that came. And we see that black people mostly, they are working for these people and don't have access, access to land, which is a big issue. And also indigenous people that is other topic that is really uh, confusing and, and sad for our country. But speaking in a, in a broader manner, um, Brazil has a big, big issue with internet connection. So you could think like, wow, we can have all these courses, all these workshops, uh, and people will see this. But in, in the rural areas, you can you don't have good connection or you don't have connection at all, and then also uh, access to formal education in Brazil it's really uh, unequal because you have the public schools which have really low investment from the government and you have private schools, so the privileged ones go to the schools and they will learn more and they will learn things better and they will have more access to our universities which are private and also um, uh, public, but uh, of course the ones that get better scores go to these good ones and mostly people that don't have access to good education to go. And uh, so this makes things really tricky because uh, there's this small percentage of people in this in, in coffee growing that have this access to more resources, resources, information and everything and are able to speak another language that is other topic we're gonna talk at, uh, later. And they get to get this, all this part of the, the, the share of the markets. And the ones that are in the, in the farms, they don't, don't get this. And however, uh, we have, uh, National Rural Learning Service that is called SENAR, which help us, help us, I mean like coffee farmers a lot because they have these courses that are really, they try to integrate everyone and it doesn't need, to, the, the people that participate don't need to have like a formal, formal education. They, they are sure that everybody can participate and, and learn, which is really nice. But, uh, and also another thing that is really good about the, the Senar, Senar system is that they go at the farms and they are like person to person to people there because uh, now in, during the pandemic, they try to do everything online, but producers don't have access to internet. So they cannot have the, the courses. And the set also one sad part of this is that not so many people know about the, these programs. So they don't go to the classes. And this is a service that us uh, producers, we have to do everything we sell. We have a small percentage that go to them. 
So it's not from the government itself. So it, 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 it makes it running. And yeah, I think it's, it's really about this. Like you have some, the state farms and privileged ones that get all this information we are talking about and the small farmers that don't have access to it at all. Yeah, like Isabel says, it, it's it's really hard. I think Colombian and Brazilian farmers are better off than, than most farmers everywhere. You know, in Colombia as well, we have the you know we have the FNC, which has for many years had its extension services, which which kind of does the the training for farmers. Although it's it's very unequal access uh, anyway, because there's there's very few uh, technicians available for farmers. But in general, I think the the whole the whole the coffee farmers, especially smallholder farmers, you know, they are self, either self-taught or they have been taught by their, you know, by generations. Their, their father or their grandfather is the one that has taught them how to grow coffee and, you know, what to, what to do in, in this case or this other case. Uh, and, you know, you'd be surprised, but, you know, farmers have a lot to, to, to teach us. You know, I, I think most of the things I've learned uh, have been, have been taught by, by farmers themselves. They are, they are, they're smart people. They 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 are uh, very very people that, that that really know and 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 understand their trade very well. So, you know the the the, the challenge is today. Things are moving very fast. You know, technology is, is growing. It's, it's becoming more important, more important, and that's where I think we're having a, a harder time with farmers, with small farmers these days, because as Isabel mentioned. There's no internet access. They, you know, there, there's also a generational gap, a huge generational gap. Most farmers are very old, around their 60s or 50s, uh, and so you you show them a smartphone and they're like, you know, what is this? You know, I don't I don't know this. So there's there's the generational gap. There's the, the, the you know the, the language barrier that 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 we've we've talked about as well. You know, most things, especially marketing wise, are in English, so it, it, it's it's very hard for them to really understand what happens in the market, and they're so far away from the market, and that language barrier makes it even harder for them. Uh, so it's 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 a combination of factors that that just make it very hard for farmers to really uh, be able to improve, and they they do improve the quality, they do improve uh, uh, their their quality of life if they have good partners that are, are buying their coffee at good prices. But as I said, said before, there's now a, a, a glass ceiling for most farmers. You know, that's, that's, that's it. That's where you can get and, and you can't go any further. And that's also that's due to technological barriers. You know, roasters these days and baristas these days have all these sort of technological advances. And I, and I always say that the, the, the most advanced technology that a farmer has in, the, in their farm is called a, a pulper which was invented in the 19th century. That's it, that's, that's all the technology that farmer has. So, the, so, so it, it, we need to, to, to start to think about the farmers in a different way and actually, first of all, deliver technology to them uh, and you know, deliver things in, in, in their own language, but also we have to, to make sure that the, the younger generations are also part of, of, the, the, of the coffee uh, trade. And that's that's really hard because, of course, the opportunities in the, in the rural areas are very limited uh, for 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 most people. And so, that's where coffee needs to play a, a good role because if the younger generations feel that coffee is profitable, it's something that they can live for for the rest of their lives, and their their sons and daughters and their grandsons can also live from coffee. Then things change dramatically, and 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 that that was a, the story in the past, you know, in the in the 50s and, and 60s and 70s when prices were higher, that's how most of rural Colombia really improved their quality of life. And it's the same story in Brazil. And it was the same story in Mexico and same story in Guatemala, you know, during the, when, when the coffee pact existed, that was a huge, huge benefit for farmers. And then prices went down and, you know, it, it's, it's become the other way around. You know, the opportunities are less and less available. Uh, and and their pockets have changed, of course. You know, you can't you can't generalize, but but it, for the most part, uh, the, the 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 inequities in in between farmers and uh, consumers and roasters as well, and even baristas is, is huge and something that is that is harming the industry, uh, uh, and and is is something that we need to really address very soon. Uh, first, I'd like to say that I only slightly resent you calling. 50 year old coffee farmers very old, having just turned 40. <laughs> uh, I feel like I'm creeping up there. Um, 
But you raise a really interesting point that I would love to for us to sort of expand upon, which is coffee farming is not exempt from the ways that the rest of the world's agriculture has industrialized, right? And this, you're you're saying that the that coffee farming as a craft, as a craft, as a trade, was passed down through generations, and the knowledge about agronomy, the knowledge about tilling soil, the knowledge about certain types of fertilizers. And um, that was all passed down. It was all, it's established in the, in the communities and in the community culture. And then you get the industrialized sort of marketplace or this demand for an industrialized agricultural marketplace that comes in and says, you need technology and you need a certain amount of technology you need to plant a certain amount and you need to be efficient to a certain degree. And, you know, I've been doing a lot of reading about how this transition from small family farms to industrialized farming has like really damaged a lot of different countries that have gone through this um, sort of over time as people move out of rural areas into urban areas, all the things that we see also reflected in coffee. And so I wanna ask, you know, the conversation is sort of generally speaking about access to information, but how much does it matter who that information comes from and what their end goals are? And do we want to increase access to information that simply industrializes and it enforces a kind of idea about efficiency being the end goal? Or do we want to also prioritize the ongoing traditions that people have had for years? And do we need to change our expectations in terms of what the output looks like in order to make room for that? You know, does that, I, I would love to hear what you all think about that. Um, and if I'm just uh, going off, <laughs> off the rail. No, if, if I may, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard balance to, to, to get to, of course, because you know, we, we see farmers like farmers in Oaxaca, in Mexico, that they're, they, they follow ancient, really, you know, 100 year old traditions, they, they still have their typica, the old typica trees, they're all in the shade, you know, they're, they're small producing three, five bags of, of coffee a year, which, you know, it's not enough. And it's not enough, not because they're not productive, it's not enough because there's, there's, the, there's the conundrum of quality, price, and efficiency, right? And at least our approach at Caravella has been, we're not going to tell them how to grow coffee. That's not our role, is not to tell them how to grow coffee. Our role is to help them find markets where they can be get a better price for what they already produce. And if we can help them improve in certain aspects without changing their, their, their traditions, so be it. You know, uh, the, the issue is how to respect each, other, each people's tradition and, and help them in, 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 in any way that you can to actually improve their quality of life. They, they're so humble, they don't need that much money. They, they're, they just, you know, when, when you talk to most of these farmers, the smallholder farmers, they just need to be appreciated and, and be, be heard, right? That's, that's what they're looking for. They're not generally necessarily looking for money. So you need to respect that because you don't want to change, you don't want to convert them to, you know, uh, consumerism and, and, and things like that, because that's not their, their way of life, right? Uh, but then you find other farmers, which, you know, they are, you know, they do want to, to, to make more money. They do see that as, as because they do want to educate their children, and they want the children to go to college, and, and they, they're, they're, they're yearning for, for more and more. So those farmers, we approach them differently, because, you know, of course, they're looking for a, a different quality of life, and that's, that's fine, too. So in the end, it's how, how to listen to the farmers and to see how I can help them with their traditions, with their cultures. I'm not trying to, to, to impose anything to them, but actually work together with them, with their culture and, and, have, and, and helping them generate a better quality of life, whatever that means for each one of them. Because quality of life doesn't mean the same for everybody, right? And that's what you kind of need to understand is, you know, what, where can I be of use useful to these to these farmers how can i listen to them and, and, and help them do and, and for example the mexican farmers we we started working with them four or five years ago and they're, they're so appreciative and, and you know they're still producing five bags but now they're making twice as much 
and they're being recognized and they're being they're being they have a transparent uh, relationship and that is extremely extremely helpful uh, uh, some farmers just want money other farmers want a combination of a lot of a lot of other things and that's kind of what you have to to really get get to and and, and that's where I think one of the things we've done very well, in my opinion, is that we've we work with people that are from the communities. We don't bring, uh, you know, the, the urban boys to the to rural areas to tell them what to do. We hire people from the rural areas, from those same areas, and we listen to both of them. And and, and then we we say, what strategy can we do to help them farmers without really imposing anything? Um, and that's that's a different way of doing things. That's 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 what I call educating and not, you know. Uh, imposing anything and that's that's what we'd like to do is just educate them and 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 sometimes they don't even know what they're doing you know but they're, they're doing fantastic stuff so you know why change it if you're doing already great stuff we don't have to come in and say you have to do this 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 and that no your coffee is fantastic how it is you know perfect you know there there, is, there will be willing buyers for this coffee you don't have to do anything you know? so and sometimes you see, you know, coffee buyers come in and say you have to do this, 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 and that because they've seen it somewhere else, uh, and that's that's fine. But you know, sometimes it's not because maybe the farmer didn't ask ask for it. If the farmer asked for it, yeah, fine. You can you can tell them what you think. But if the farmer is not asking that, it's just asking for a transparent, a fair relationship. That's 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 fair too. That's 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 good too. Um, so it's also about understanding the cultural differences. Um, you know, and, and, and of course, there's the whole talk about colonialism and imperialism in coffee. That is part of the, the story, of course, yes. Um, and of course, you know, there's the buyer power, you know, buyers, it's, it's a buyer's market, the coffee market, and that's not great for the, for the, for the coffee industry. Uh, some people like to compare coffee with wine and it's completely different, you know, winemakers and coffee growers are two different animals, if you will, right? Um, so you, you can't you can't just say because wine or because beer or because something you, you just put into into coffee because that you do have to understand those cultural differences and and, and what what are the aspirations and, and the wants and the needs of, of, of each stakeholder in, in the coffee industry how to balance that is kind of the the, the, the question yeah that's really interesting I've got everything that you said is really interesting my my gears are turning but uh, this is not the uh, sit and watch me process things show. This is a panel discussion. Um, so, but sort of leading to that, I would love, Samaya, to you, do you have a, you have a perspective to offer, I'm sure, especially since um, Rwanda in particular had such an interesting history with coffee before specialty coffee sort of entered the scene. You sort of mentioned 2013, I remember the, um, uh, specialty coffee coming in and sort of paying attention to Rwanda as a as a country that where there was all this opportunity to work with smallholders who had experienced so much over time and this influx of new information, um, especially since specialty coffee itself is sort of a moving target. What has the impact of that been? Sort of folks coming in and saying, you know, we would love to work with you and to have you produce this type of coffee that fits in this sort of set of categories, you know, what has your experience been along those lines? Amazing. I really love what, um, uh, is it, how, what was your name? <laughs> I forgot how to pronounce your name well, but you mentioned something really important. Um, I would say that we, as he mentioned, we don't have to always impose. There's something that is already there. And looking for sustaining or empowering the young generation who are going to take over is strengthening what we have at the moment. Like how are we going to make these people feel valued and strengthened so that their kids will see their parents smiling so that they can envision farming or coffee farming activity to be part of their future. Because they are moving, as you mentioned, they're moving to the cities and they are trying to get what they can to never live the same life as their parents. So before there was just this, as, but also there's always a room for improvement. But how you are initiating those, is, we just have to do it in a humble way, not in a direct way, but allow them to also tell you what they were already doing before you impose them to do certain things. Um, they will they will tell you and there's agronomy uh 
you uh, most of the people who come to teach our farmers will be people like personally i go to learn how to roast coffee in america because there is no school in africa or there's few schools now but i personally learned how to roast but i know home we roast in a clay pot and we understand the right time to get the beans out of the clay pot from the firewood so there is that and every single time farmers will use the uh, they will embrace the coffee or they will do whatever they can in their capacity in their resources that is available for them so when you come in to only impose without any support ne neither be the education the access to education and in a long term goal in a sustainable way access to resources access to capital to implement what you're trying to impose that's a huge problem over there and we're not going to be able to do that and you come back and like oh you cannot sell me coffee because your coffee doesn't have probably this certification your coffee doesn't taste this way because every definition of everything comes from the consuming side not the farming side so if we are able to have their voices hard or sh them sharing the experiences, what they consider or what they define to be high quality coffee, then you can draw from that, find a cohesive combination of both uh, great technology from the Western world, plus the tradition, put it all together, which will also accommodate them with the resources that is available for them. That's how I look at it. And then we can ensure the future of the industry. And then we'll empower the younger generation that way. They will see that there's a lot of possibilities and then they can take part. So I always imagine this farming, you know, the production of the producing country with a lot of innovation, creativity from the youth, youth taking part. You know, I talk to a lot of uh, my fellow Rwandans who are at my age, like, how do you even do that? Like, how do you get there? I can never be you, you know, you don't have to be me. I can never go back to the farm. I just want to go and, you know, become a housemaid somewhere. At least I can make money to help my mom buy another shirt because she has been wearing that shirt for a week. You can imagine. So there are certain things that we can. And as he mentioned, they don't need a lot. Just a small thing that is going to change their entire life. You, If you come and give them scissors for pruning, that's already a lot. It's going to add up to the quality because it's even harder for them to buy that. Um, so it's just that's how I see it on my on my from my experience. Thank you. That's really interesting. I would love to use that as a launching pad to talk about the last sort of big topic, which we had discussed in the pre-work, which is language barriers. And I would say, Maya, you saying you come to America to learn about roasting, thinking Alejandro about folks, you know, like the, the, the expectations that are placed on communities that are technical manuals that are written in English or written by buyers or, or advice that's given by buyers. Um, and Isabel too, you had also said something like, if I'm remembering correctly, you said something like 5% of Brazilians speak fluent English and all of the materials that we have specifically about specialty coffee speaking about our expectations for quality, for um, flavor profile, for the way that the flavor and the story captures the essence of a place. It all comes to us from English speaking directives, it seems to me. And what has the, you know, what have you all seen as being the, the real barriers that language presents? And have you run into issues where you, you have access to a, a piece of material, but there's no translation. You can't share it with anyone. You know, what, what has that experience been for you all? Okay, so I go first. <laughs> so yeah, like uh, Brazil is the biggest producer of Arabica and all, almost all the information is in English for us. And now that we are having this, uh, for example, contacts through internet with the pandemic, I see that there's a lot of panels that are really interesting, talk about coffee producing and coffee growing, and there's no translation to Portuguese. Another thing, 
that is related to these barriers, but also to, um, to money, to having more money to be able to participate, is that coffee fairs that are like in, in consumer countries, consuming countries, they are expensive to coffee growers to even go to that. And then if they get there, they will not know how to communicate. So then they cannot do the networking. And then again comes the tricky thing that the most prepared ones will get the most share of things. So connecting this to the thing that we were talking about, and Alejandro and Simaya said things that I can really relate to, is that uh, sometimes when we have the term defined by the consumer side, we have to do that to produce that but uh, my question is at what price because uh, in brazil last week we had a really uh, sad news that one of the one state farm was encountered with uh, slavery and we know that this farm by the, the news had a lot of certifications had exported coffee sales a lot in the in the in our internal market. And so I got thinking like, if we have to have this certain uh, copy, cupping scores and this thing, like how are we gonna produce that? Like, are they seeing what are our challenges at the farm and seeing like how this is like social sourced? Like, does it means uh, like the, the cup score has more value than what is happening here, like the conditions with, that we were having. Because like seeing from a, a small producer side, like my father is a small producer, like now you're seeing that the, the, cost, the, the, the prices are high, but we, pay, we have a lot of uh, dispenser here. Like we have to pay for things, the machines are expensive and we have to pay for the labor. So like, what is like why you like what is coming with this price like sometimes when people have to encounter these prices these things happens and people are not looking at it so specialty coffee it's not only about the scores and people should start looking for social things like alejandro said like really nice what the work that the work that he has encountered and like the traditional stuff and Sometimes it's not even heard, maybe because we don't speak English and we are not able to tell our, um, ourselves, or there's no tra translator to help us. So uh, this is this is what I wanted to leave as contribution. Um, I think I can add to that a little bit. Um, I think it will all fall back to the having or empowering youth to be part of it because then if they can learn these things they will then be the great people to go back because they can speak the language they're they're not very old to learn a new language or a new technology these are the great ambassadors to go back and train their own parents um, i was part of the innovation whereby we're helping farmers um we're dealing with contractual problems and and you know issues they don't know how to read they don't know how to write so you they always have somebody to read the contract with the buyer for them and you know it's, it's a big problem but if they had a child that just finished high school they can go back and just do a weekend session whereby he or she teaches their parents how to write a b c or what then that's how we're going to ensure the sustainability or the future of the industry we want them to take part and them allowing them to take part is to have all this access to information, um, access to education, access to capital, which is the most uh, hardest thing in, in, you know, countries are doing great. Um, I'm really grateful for Rwanda to have allowed nine years basic of education. At least you can talk some English afterwards um, and allow girls to attend school. So we're trying to use this opportunity for these guys because they're not going to find a job anyway. There are a lot of them out there. So to use them to go back, but they have to see their mothers being valued. They have to see something good happening to them. They have to see the value that it leads into growing the coffee so that they can see the future. 
So th without that, they're not going, we're not going to join. We're just going to be searching for jobs elsewhere. Um, and, you know, and there is no future of the coffee if we're not going to take part of it. So I think the youth to be empowered and to take part into teaching their own, uh, it will really, really facilitate a lot and it will cover the gap of language barrier and more. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I, I, we have talked in our, in our pre-work uh, about how the coffee institutions are all based in, in consuming countries, right? Uh, even the ICO, which is, you know, it's, it's supposed to be a, 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 a institution of coffee growers and coffee consumers is based in London. Um, there's, there's really no coffee institution, no major international coffee institution based in any consuming, any, any origin countries. All of them are in, in, in consuming countries and all, as you said, uh, you all said, all the manuals, all the uh, the norms, all the criteria, all the you know, all, everything is comes from 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 the states or from any any of the, the, the you know English speaking countries. Even today, you, know, you, you look at barista competitions. If you don't speak English, you have no options of winning the barista competition. And and, and you know, I'm, I'm really happy that Diego Campos won the barista competition. But he he had com competed two other times. And the other two times he competed, he had competed in Spanish, but he didn't win because he had he was speaking in Spanish. Now he had to go for two years to Australia to learn English to have a chance of winning a barista competition. That in itself shows how inequity, how much inequity there is in coffee. Because if you don't speak English, you have very little chances of succeeding in anything around. And you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm privileged. I I speak English. I think all of us here are privileged because we speak English, and that's a, that's probably why we're here. If if we didn't speak English, we haven't been invited to, to talk in this in this in this in this webinar. It's simple as that. So it's it's unfortunate because if you look at coffee, it's actually because of Latin countries and African countries and you know East, East Asian Asian countries that coffee exists. You know, it's it, it's it's a simple fact. You know, if if we didn't grow coffee in Latin America or in in Africa, there wouldn't be no coffee. Even the Dutch, the, the British, the Portuguese, the Spanish, they all had to come here to, to, to grow a coffee, right? Uh, but 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 the, the balance of power has always been geared to, towards towards uh, consuming countries. And even I mentioned this to Haynes in one of our meetings, you know, you, you look at all the research being done in coffee these days, and it's all being done in Texas A&M, in UC Davis, you know, and all these American or British or, 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 or other uh, universities. And there's there's a lot of uh, researchers in, in 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 origin. There's a lot of great universities in, in in Latin America that they could partner with to do a lot of the research that they have to do on the ground with students from from uh, from Latin American universities or African universities, which could add a huge amount of of, of wealth to those to those to that research. But that, that's not done. That, unfortunately, that's not the way things are done in, in, in the industry. Everything is done in, 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 in uh, consuming countries. And there's very little collaboration even with, with institutions within um, uh, uh, origin countries. You know, there's, Brazil has tons of research and then you, you don't see it quoted in any other uh, uh, paper because it's in Portuguese, it's not in English. So it's not quoted. Simple as that. There's Sunny Cafe in Colombia has done fantastic research. It's not known anywhere because it's in Spanish. It's not in English. So all the research that are in, in the in, in the universities in the US or in Britain or in France, they don't quote them. They're not even seen, you know. So so you can see how 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 important the language barrier is. And that's something that we need to change in the industry. And even to, to finalize, green coffee buyers. How many green coffee buyers speak Spanish? One, two, five percent. It should, you know, it should be a prerequisite if you're a coffee buyer to speak Spanish. Uh, imagine, you know, if you could speak Spanish or you could, you could speak Portuguese, how how you could actually relate better to with your suppliers and actually make a more meaningful uh, change in, in in your relationships. But that's not something that 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 is expected of green coffee buyers because they're the buyer. So, you know, it's it's. It's unfortunate, and it's something that I think we all need to to be aware of, and we need to change that. That's such a good point, Alejandra. I was thinking about how 
I barely speak Spanish. I am so shy about Spanish. And yet here I have this opportunity to moderate this panel. You all speak these other beautiful languages and you, you know, you are all made to speak to me in the language that I'm the native speaker of. And that is, you know, also endemic of like who, to whom do we capitulate in this industry? What would happen if, if the prerequisite was for every document to be written in Spanish, Portuguese, and you know, various languages throughout Africa and Asia, um, and then you know, make English speakers work a little harder for it. Uh, I don't know. It's just a, it's an interesting way to think about who gets legitimized. Um, and you're right, we wouldn't have coffee, you know? I don't know, but I'm just, thank you all so much. Um, now you can see that I'm just spinning because I'm thinking so much and I'm, I appreciate your perspective so much. And this is exactly the kind of conversation that I am still in coffee for. So I appreciate you. Um, and it looks like we have opened up some questions. If, if anyone would like to ask any of the panelists anything, please feel free uh, to drop it in the chat or there's a Q&A box. Um, and uh, we can get those answered. But in the meantime, too, if there's anything that you all would like to ask of each other as well, um, you know, this is a good opportunity for us to just keep chatting while we wait for questions to come in. Um, and I'm reading in the in the chat box here. Oh yeah, um, like training labs and and. Uh, quality control. And I was even thinking about how the coffee tasters flavor wheel is very much based on consuming countries' perspectives on flavors that we're familiar with or foods that exist. And I wonder how that impacts a producer's relationship with the way that they talk and think about coffee. And, you know, I, I can imagine being from a place that's never experienced a lot of the flavors on that wheel and going, I don't know what this means. How am I supposed to identify quality. Um, yeah, this is Maya, you're nodding. Do you have an experience with that? Have you, have you all had that experience where people are, uh, you're tasting with producers and they're like, I don't know what this is. <laughs> yes, I had that. Um, part of the things that had to do with that program was to initiate some of the education. Obviously, as I mentioned, I continued to have a lot of opportunities for me to acquire these knowledge from the other world. So, and I, ha I always had to struggle translating everything in my, in my uh, native language, Kenya Rwanda, which some of them couldn't work out, but like I would find something similar. And taking into consideration farmers not being able to read, so I'll put those flavor in colors and say that, okay, the bribe more like a lemon is gonna be this. We don't have access to all those, um, most of the fruits, we don't have to access to a lot of things. Um, but my biggest concern as I was writing more about um, defects, uh, it was really important for me because it, it, it really hurt me every single time I had to travel and sit with the buyers and they want to hear about me and it was like, oh, but Rwandan coffee and Burundian coffee has potato defect. Can you elaborate more about it? Like, First of all, what is that? <laughs> so um, farmers that having access to a uh, lab to quality control their own coffee before it even leaves the origin, it's a big problem. How are they going to be able to be aware of what to improve next season when they don't know what they have done wrong? And um, as we mentioned before, everything, the quality is defined by the consumer world, which is okay. Most of farmers don't even drink coffee. Uh, we had to teach them how to drink coffee. It's okay to teach a person what everything that the coffee has to offer. But at the same time, we want their skills to be part of that research or part of that education, because then it will be much easier for us to educate them about something that they already have knowledge about, because they live it. They spend most of their time in the trees, in the farms. Um, so they've got knowledge, but the confidence to get it out there, it's not because you've already ruined it by imposing them to, or by making them feel a certain way. So if we can build the confidence 
support in them and then have education and support, as I mentioned, then there will be men, they will make solutions for everything else that is happening for them. Um, so I think that's how I think about it. What about you, Isabel or Alejandro? So ever for this question, like while I was preparing, I asked for help from my friends, El Gandraji and Rafael Moraes. They are two graders in Brazil and they work for Senar, that uh, rural education that I told before. And they brought really nice insights because they've been like all around Brazil uh, teaching farmers to cup their coffees which is really important because in Brazil happens that you send your, um, for the, your sample of your coffee and then somebody will tell you which quality is it. And uh, often the producers don't know. So they, they tell that it's this or that they're gonna accept. And so this is a really important process to empower farmers in my conception. And the, the problem with the flavors, Will, is that, like Sumaya said, some of the, like most of the flavors we have that we don't have access, access in Brazil to buy it. So they don't know this, this, um, these flavors. Like I've been in some of the courses together with other farmers and it's really hard for the person who is teaching to make like something that is more alike in Brazil. And what Elga told me is that when they do, for example, uh, some coffee to sell in the internal market, they try to uh, describe with the things that are more like in the internal part of the, the, the flavors will than the edges because, and then relate to fruits in Brazil, like jabuticaba, goiaba, that are fruits that are only grown in Brazil. So, and then a thing that Rafael told me that I really thought it was really uh, insightful is that the, the flavors will was based more in washed coffees and in Brazil we have more naturals. So don't make much sense for us. Uh, that's it. <laughs> yeah, you know, Isabel just mentioned something that we also uh, have, have learned is that we don't teach um, the, our cuppers about the, the the outside flavors. We only teach them about the central flavors, which are kind of like you know very basic flavors that you can relate to citrus or you know uh, malic flavors. Because our understanding of citrus is very different from the understanding of, of of most other people. That you know we don't have lemons, we have limes. So and we call limes lemons. And so you know there's also that. <laughs> um, so we teach them just the center part and 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 we then say, you know, citrus in for us means more of like this, you know, tropical flavors are this and, and so on. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it's very funny because even today, you know, most buyers are not even communicating the, the descriptors. Most buyers today have, have just opted to say accept or reject it. And, and, and you know, the, the use of scores is less and less and less uh, communicated by, by buyers when they approve or reject samples. Um, and that's something that, that I find quite interesting because instead of giving us more, they're giving less. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I get it that we, you know, maybe the flavors that they give us are not something that we will understand, but we can translate. You know, we can say your flavors, when you say this, we say this. And to do that properly, we need to have their flavors and our flavors so that we can build our database and say, see, when, when that person says that, we, we mean this. And that would just help communicate us much better. So, that, so, so even there, there's a language barrier because, you know, if we don't get the the, the flavors, the descriptors, we can't build the database to 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 make that that uh, an analysis. And that's that's that's, in my opinion, very unfair because you know we, they should be trying to give us more and more information instead of less and less information. Um, so, yeah, it, it's again, it, it's all about. Who, who dictates the norms, the standards, and, and instead of being collaborative, it's, it's, it's again, imposed, 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 imposed. Uh, and and that, 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 that there should be a, a, a movement in the specialty industry to say, let's collaborate and let's build something that is inclusive, that in, includes everybody and not just our views of, of the world. Ever, can I, I, I add yes. something? Of course. Uh, also uh, for us to have the equipment, 
for doing the for having the cupping station is really expensive. So to think that a coffee farmer, a small coffee farmer has the, the, the equipment is like unimaginable. Like it's, it's really, really, um, uh, really out of hand. Like uh, when they get some copy lab, they get reunited in some sort of association to do that. But again, like sometimes there's not few graders to, uh, to be there cupping with them. So it's really, really a barrier. Well, you've all inspired me to start an initiative where we get uh, producing countries to develop their own tasting meals with local fruit and uh, local flavors. Um, because I it's astounding to me that that has not yet happened. Um, so let's do that. So I'll, I'll meet you all after the panel. <laughs> we'll get to work. Um, does anyone else have any questions before, while we're wrapping up? It, it seems like, I mean, I think that you all can see the chat too, but it really seems like a lot of what you have said have, has really deeply resonated with people who are here. And I know that it's all really deeply resonated with me. And I, I really appreciate your perspectives and um, just listening to and learning from you all is such a gift. And Haynes, thank you so much for putting this together and to Vanderbilt and the Wondery and to Alejandro for, for sponsoring the translation in Spanish, um, the interpretation in Spanish. And just thank you all so much. Um, yeah, any final thoughts, any final words? Uh, I'm participating in one project and I wanted to take a picture of us, but it's really interesting. I will just get the camera and I will be back, you'll be back, okay? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I would like to say that it's important that we have more of these conversations and, and, and be as open and frank as, as we can uh, and, and include people from, from everywhere. You know, most of, most of the conversations are between a very limited amount of people uh, who usually think the same or have the same backgrounds and sort of cultures. And, and, and that's, if, if there's any, anything that is beautiful about the coffee industry is the fact that we are very diverse. Uh, but we should not just say we're diverse, we should embrace diversity in, in, and, and really make sure that we are all part of this and not just, you know, ah, we're diverse, yeah, it's so great. <laughs> you know, we have to move from the, from the words to the actions, I, I guess that's what I'm, I'm trying to say. I agree. Um, I think Alejandro mentioned everything I was gonna say. <laughs> Thank you, Alejandro. Um, <laughs> Exactly. And I think for people who are not uh, coffee professionals, I'm sure some of our audience, people don't know anything that we've been talking about, the flavor wheels and stuff. I think I would just tell you one thing, buy coffee or if you're a coffee person, a coffee lover, just go buy from a roster or a local coffee shop that you know for sure are having an impact to the people behind the coffee. So, and that will be through the interaction they will have with, with you. They will tell you where they source their coffees. They're doing the direct source. Really be proud of yourself buying a cup of coffee, paying $3 per cup, knowing that you're supporting people that you have never probably going to be able to meet. But you are doing great. And thank you all for having us. And I think part of the change, this is part of the change, having this conversation is the start and the specialty coffee association has been also doing, uh, trying to really come up with a lot of different inclusive and equity uh, uh, conversation. And we're really proud of that and be able to be part of that. So I hope that we can now move from conversations to action in the future. Thank you.